Hello everyone, Roger Wolpert here. Got something new I want to try out here on my YouTube channel. And uh, I'm pretty excited about it and I hope you guys will be too. Um, I'm calling this Making Dust. And what Making Dust is, it's just going to be uh, some episodes where I interview other carvers and artists and um, just kind of have a conversation with them uh, via Zoom and I'll record it and then share it with all with you guys. So for my first episode of Making Dust here, I have the legendary gourd artist Bonnie Gibson. So um, she shares all kinds of knowledge and she's just a great artist and an incredible carver. And I think you guys will find her very interesting and I'm pretty sure you're gonna enjoy our conversation. So here we go. Got Bonnie Gibson here on the line with me and uh, we're on Zoom. And uh, Bonnie is a fabulous gourd artist. Um, she's an author, a businesswoman, teacher, very involved in the American Gourd Society, and a wife and mother. And Bonnie is somebody who I have been following quite some time on social media and through the American Gourd Society. And her gourds and her artwork is just incredible. And I am very honored to be able to interview you, Bonnie. I'm uh, so glad that you accepted to sit down with me and talk about your work. Glad to be here. <laughs> so, um, well, let's just start moving along here. Um, for people who's not familiar with hard shell gourds and uh, what they are and what you can do with them, can you um, kind of just give us an overview of what the gourd is and, and the, kind of how the process turning a piece of fruit into a piece of art. Sure, be glad to. So you've got some pictures there of hard shelled gourds and gourds come in two varieties, ornamental and hard shell. And the ornamental ones generally aren't going to last, they're going to rot and collapse. Uh, little small pumpkin shaped ones you maybe see in the grocery store. But hard shell gourds are actually like wood once they've hardened. They grow green as you show in the first picture. Then through a process of molding and evaporation, they turn into the dried gourd you see in the, in the uh, second picture. However, the one you show there is already nice and clean. A uh, gourd right out of the field is going to look moldy and will need to be washed and clean. And then from there you can carve it like you can carve on wood or any other similar surface. So, yeah, I like, I, I've carved some gourds in my time, and um, what I really like about a gourd is you're right, it's kind of like carving on wood, but without the hassles of grain. True. There, they, it has its own challenges, though. For example, on the gourd, you have uh, areas that might be softer. In one area, maybe where it's sat on its bottom in the field, that area might be softer. Um, the skin area is hard, whereas the inner pulp is a little bit softer, but it's pretty close to carving in basswood or something else that is uh, very low grain. Yep. And uh, can you tell me where you get your gourds for carving? Yeah, I buy most of my gourds locally here in Arizona from the Wurtz Gourd Farm. Um, I do buy gourds from other places, but generally I prefer to buy gourds where I can go and hand pick the shapes that I want. That's why I don't normally order online. I'll, I'll buy them in person from a grower. So here in Illinois, our gourds, because our growing season is quite a bit smaller than your Arizona, California growing season, our gourds are generally very thin walled. So I, when I order a gourd for carving, I usually order it online. <laughs> or Yes, I feel very lucky to live in an area where I can get thicker shelled gourds and go pick them out. And I've tried to grow my own gourds here in Illinois and you know they they look nice but they were just almost paper thin they didn't that's have right them. yeah um so that kind of leads to my next question you know are all gourds suitable for carving and I'm not sorry. really <laughs> not okay. really I, I I pick gourds based on their thickness and if you are familiar with them you learn to pick them up squeeze them to see if there's any give to the shell, shake them to hear if it has a light tinny sound, which means it's thin, or a more of a dull thudding sound, which indicates it might be a little thicker. 
also different varieties will have different thicknesses. So you will never find a thick shelled apple or cannonball gourd, for example. Uh, you will find thick and thin in bottle gourds and kettle gourds and some other varieties. So you kind of know after a while which shapes are going to have better chance of being thick. Now I think about it, I think about every gourd I've ever carved or played with was either kettle or canteen style. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've done much with anything besides those two. Well, I actually carve in cannonballs, but I do different kind of carving. Cannonballs, because they're so very hard, even though they're thin, they're very hard, they are wonderful for techniques like filigree. Right. And yeah, so like the ones from, like I said, here in Illinois, they're super thin. They're not great for carving, but they are good for uh, making what they call gourd lights, where you poke holes and then it illuminates. So, yep. They're okay. pro probably a lot easier to wood burn on, too. Yes, yes. All right, so this right here is a, a very good example of the kind of gourds that, uh, Bonnie, you carve. And... I'm sure everybody watching on YouTube or wherever they're watching this are pretty amazed right now. So I know I am. I, 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 I honestly, I can't look at your gourds enough. <laughs> I, well, I love you. watching I your work. And uh, so I am, I, I, um, I do want to point out that the gourd on the lower left is not my work. What's um, it? That? It looks like it might be Phyllis Sickles. I display a lot of other people's gourd art on my website. Um, well, and a lot leaves, of people carve in a similar style. The leaves right here? Yes. Really? Okay. Well, I'll have to give her a shout out then. So I'm glad you brought that up. I'm just guessing that's who it is. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, can you talk about you know, just where you, what kind of inspirations you have that, that drives your work? Sure. Um, I, I like all different kinds of art. And when I look online, I tend not to look at other people's gourd art because I don't want to copy other people. I want to do something a little different. But I have no problem with looking at all kinds of nature sites. I look at other artists that are in different media, such as ceramics, or wood turning, or wood carving <clears throat> or anything that you know appeals to me and pick up small elements from each of those you don't ever want to copy anybody directly but you can always say hey i really like how they did that um, that spiral on that indian pot or i really like how they did that hole piercing in the wood turning and you can borrow ideas back and forth without copying right so i i um follow your Facebook page and I, I, you post a lot of stuff like that on there. Um, I've seen lace work on, you know, from like even doilies and, and ceramics and yeah, it, you're right. And it, it's, it is hard not just to directly copy somebody. It, it is, especially when you see something that you really like, but I always encourage people, even in classes, not to just copy the class example but to use what you're learning as a technique and then put your own little spin on it so that when you go home, you're proud and you say, I did this. While I learned it in a class, I put my own take on it. So um, I wanna ask you real quick, Phil agree, you had mentioned it earlier. And um, can you go ahead and define exactly what filigree is? Well, filigree is kind of funny. It's, it's, a, it's a term I actually coined for the gourd world. Uh, wood turners did it long, long before any gourd people ever did it. And they just called it hole piercing. And I wanted something that was more descriptive. So when I started doing it on gourds, I just called it filigree. And it's kind of come into accepted use. I think the wood turning world still just calls it hole piercing. And ceramic artists probably have their own, um, I think they might be call it lattice work or something. Every field seems to have their own terminology. I did not know you coined that. I'd always referred to it as filigree myself. I did not you know that you uh, had the origin on that. Well, I didn't originate the hole piercing. I just came up with the name. 
Um, and like I said, there were other people doing it before me. The, the first person I ever knew of that did it on gourds was a man by the name of Mark Doolittle, who is also a fabulous wood carver, wood turner. Um, you can look him up online. He has some beautiful work. I'm going to write that name down. That's Mark Doolittle. Yes, and he actually has a gourd in the very first Jim Whitus Ginger Summit complete book of gourd crafting. I believe it's in there. And that was what inspired me to give it a shot. I own that book. I will definitely look that up. Uh, this is your website. This is uh, it's bonniegibsonart.com, right? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so first of all, I want to compliment you on your website. It is a very clean, nice, easy to use website. Um, so let's take a look here in your gallery at some more gourds that you have. And man, those are some incredible gourds. So, Thank you. <laughs> um, first of all, I mean, it stands out to me is your photographs are just great. <laughs> I mean, they are gallery quality photographs. Do you do your own photography? Do you have a little studio set up or do you hire that done? No, I do it all myself. And it, it's funny, it all got started back when my husband had an interest in photography. And I had been contacted in the early 2000s by a publisher about writing a book and I was hesitant to do it because I knew it was going to be a lot of work. And my husband says, oh, you should do it because then I can take all the photographs for you. Mm -hmm. And it made a lot of sense because most people that write a book have to do a project in, say, five or six different stages, five or six different gourds, and then take them to a studio and have them photographed. Whereas here at home, he had a little studio set up, and then I would take uh, 15 minutes work on a, a section of the gourd come in and he would photograph it. So it was a, a great uh, combination for the two of us to do the book together. But now I do all my pictures myself. He's gone. Unfortunately, my husband passed away four years ago. I still have the little studio set up, which is very, very simple. I'll explain it in a second. Um, and most of my phones now, pictures now are just taken with a cell phone camera because they're good quality and I am much more comfortable using that than a big fancy camera that I might not be able to use as well. So I, I had a really hard time jumping on board with taking good photos. I, I, I was kind of stubborn about it. I'm like, you know, I'm a carver. I, I'm not really a photographer, but once I finally cracked down and started trying to make an effort to have decent photos, man, what a difference it made. I think the biggest thing for people to get good photos are some pretty easy things to remember. One, you want to have an uncluttered background. You notice in most of these pictures, they either have a, a whitish background or they have a graduated background. And I went on Amazon and I purchased a backdrop, which is a sheet of mylar film that has been airbrushed so that it is white at the bottom and gradually fades to gray near the top. And I pin that sheet of mylar up to the wall and then I have a table set up and the mylar comes down off the wall and curves to sit onto the tabletop so that I put the gourd on the white portion and it, you can't see a seam because instead of bending something, it's just gradually curving from the wall to the table. That's the first thing is to have a good backdrop. The second thing, the second thing is to have good lighting. And we purchased some very inexpensive tripods uh, metal reflectors from Home Depot that are meant to take a light bulb, but we bought some special um, ot light type bulbs to put in them, natural daylight bulbs. And then they have a clip-on soft uh, plastic filter. It's, it looks nothing more than like uh, white plastic, but it diffuses the light so you don't have those really, really hard bright light spots on your pictures. And then finally, uh, another thing that is a, a good thing to do is if you're trying to take a picture of anything that is shiny, even if you have the best setup, you're going to probably get hot spots. So whenever possible, I try to take the pictures of my gourd before the final finish is applied. 
when it's still a little bit softer and more matte colored. And if I want it shinier, then I spray the, the spray on after the pictures are done. Yeah, that's good advice. I, I, uh, I just started doing that not that long ago and I, I feel actually kind of stupid that it took me almost 20 years to figure that out uh, to get rid of those hot spots. I still have a few in there and I am comfortable with some photo editing software. I don't usually change the board itself, but like if it has a big bright white hot spot, I know how to change it and correct it so the picture looks softer and more subtle. But if you look at the picture that is on the right hand side now of the canteen with the handles, that has totally been painted in acrylics and then covered in a matte spray. And just because of it being a matte spray, it is not going to show the hot spots the same way the one to the left shows a couple of bright white spots because that one is yeah. uh, done in a, a semi-gloss lacquer and is shinier. So Bonnie, I want, I want to ask you a little bit about some of the embellishments on these gourds. So like this one here, it's got some stone inlaid. Um, there's a few down the road that you've used rock. Um, if I correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this lizard was sculpted out of clay and then added to the gourd. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that. Sure, I do use some embellishments. The stone that you mentioned at the beginning uh, is a turquoise donut. It was purchased at a, a gem show. You can buy them at bead stores, things like that. I just felt I wanted to add some turquoise accent, and that's what I chose. Uh, the lizard on the top right is all made out of epoxy sculpt clay, which is a two-part epoxy clay. It becomes very, very hard. Once it is cured, it's very strong. Um, you can work on it for an hour or two, manipulate it, and when it's dry, then you can sand it and carve on it with carving tools if you would like. So that's my favorite clay to use on gourds. And so that, pulp, that uh, epoxy sculpt, you use the same burrs you would use on the gourd, You're like a double cut? Um, Sure, usually at that point, most of, the, most of the work is done and it's just a matter of a few details or clean up. But yes, something with teeth, you don't want to use something like a diamond burr, which only has grit and would clog. All right. Uh, on, the, on the upper left, I have a carved hummingbird on the top and, and a wood stick. And I want to note here that I actually was a wood carver long, long before I ever got into gourds. I started wood carving probably in the 1980s, and it wasn't until the mid 90s that I found gourds. So it's kind of a nice combination for me to put the two together. Yeah, and it's it's very nice. And I was going to talk a little bit more about your lids later, but that yeah, they're, those are impressive. Um, just. A quick guess, do you have any idea how many gourds you've carved in your lifetime? No, not really. Probably at least 5,000, I'm guessing. Oh, wow. I, I don't know. I've never really kept track. I suppose I could go back and figure it out, but that would be a challenge. And when was the first time you picked up a gourd and decided to start carving on one? Sometime in the mid-90s, uh, I, I went to an art show and there was a booth there filled with Native American pottery, which is one of my interests. And when I actually picked one of them up, it was so lightweight. And I said, this is in pottery. What is this? And the lady says, oh, these are gourds. And I was shocked because I grew up in Minnesota where all we could grow was ornamentals. I had never seen a hard shell gourd. So it was a great find for me. Little wheels started to turn in my head and especially when I realized I could carve on them just like I was carving on wood. Yeah, I can't, I can't think exactly when was the first time I realized what a hard shell gourd was and what could be done with it. But I'm pretty sure somehow it was through you <laughs> that that Possibly. happened. All right, so I wanted to jump in to more of the technical side of carving in your gourd work and talk about what tools you use. Okay, uh, sure. Yeah, you want, to, you want to go ahead and just kind of go through the list of what you got here and, and how you use them? Sure, I can, I can actually justify having a lot more tools than the average person. Most people just have one tool. 
I started out originally with a Dremel tool and then I got a Fordham tool. Uh, the one that you show on the upper left is actually a hanging model. My particular one is made to sit on a bench top and it has a variable speed controller built right into the bench top model. Uh, and my husband purchased it for me as a Christmas present when I really got into uh, the gourd carving. He thought it would be a better tool than what I was using with my Dremel. Um, I so still have those Dremels, but I don't use them as often as I used to. So does your Fordham have a flex shaft or is it, is it more like yes. a motor? motor? It has a flex shaft and I still use it, but I use it much less. I'm mainly using it when I want to do big things where I'm hogging out a lot of material. So I use it for the initial stages of my hummingbirds that I carve. I use it for very large areas where I'm trying to take off background quickly. Um, but if it's anything smaller, I'll drop down to something that I can hold a little easier as I'm getting older, I'm, I'm getting arthritis in my hands. So currently I use a micromotor tool much more often than a Dremel or a Fordham. Now the micromotor tools that you show there are three tools that I own. The one on the top was the first micromotor I purchased, the blue box one. Yep. Uh, I've got that from Master Carver. They called it the Micro Pro and I, I've used that thing to death but I recently decided to get something that offered even more power. The one that you're pointing to now is the Ram BP50 that has a brushless motor and has higher uh, RPMs and has more torque. That's the main thing. The difference is, is everybody thinks speed is everything. Speed is not everything because some burrs aren't even rated to go above say 30,000 RPM. So to turn a burr that's rated for 30,000 RPM up to 50 RPM is, you know, something you shouldn't do. So it's more the torque or the force. The Fordham is low speed, high torque. The micromotors are more kind of middle of the range. They're mid speed, mid torque, and then a dental tool like you're showing on the bottom there is very low torque and super high speed. So each has their advantage and disadvantage. Now of the micromotor tools in the center of the page, there's two shown there, the BP50, which was on the right. And then on the left is the Mestiza portable. And I got that because it, it is a lithium battery tool that I can put in my apron pocket, carry with me around classes as I'm instructing, you can take it outside and sit someplace where electricity is not available. Uh, and it has an amazing amount of power for such a small portable tool. So th does it have a pretty good torque? It does, it's surprising uh, how well it really works. I would say it and my MicroPro are pretty equivalent as far as torque and power and everything else. Really? So I own a... Um a cordless Dremel tool, I can't remember what they call it, and it, I think it maxes out at 28,000 RPMs, but it is very weak in torque. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one is, it was very surprising to me, and I, I hesitated to buy one until I went to a class where one of my students actually had one that she had purchased, and she let me try it out, and I was impressed, and I came home and bought one. Very nice. Huh. That's one of the greatest thing about classes, is getting to visit with everybody in the class and see what tools they're using and for people to exchange, you know, pros and cons and ideas about their tools. It's a great opportunity. Right. I, I'm very fond of taking carving classes. I, I miss it. <laughs> with COVID and everything going on now, I, miss, I really miss that. Sure. And I want to mention also the tool on the bottom, of course, you're much more familiar with that than a lot of people. That is the dental tool. That one is I, the one I use is made by Shofu, and um, I purchased it mm, probably 10 years ago. And while I still occasionally use it on gourds, I find I don't use it as much because it's just easier to continue using my micromotor for detail work. However, I do a lot of other artwork. Uh, I carve antler, I carve eggs, I engrave glass, and I use my Shofu for those kind of things. It works wonderful on harder surfaces. Yeah, so yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of the dental drills and 
I kind of went backwards, everybody. I started with a dental drill and then worked backwards. And then, then I bought micro motors and I bought forums. Um, but I was doing a lot of eggshell carving and metal engraving, which the dental drill just is really good for that. Yeah, it's perfect for that. And um, see, one thing I wanted to just mention is the Fordhams and the three micro motors here. You know, their burrs are what? Eighth inch shank, quarter inch yes, shank? Initially, micro motors had, uh, they were made for nail technicians and things like that, and they had all three 32nd inch collets. And it wasn't until maybe oh, I don't know, 15 years ago that they realized, hey, we're missing out on a whole hobby market here. And they started making them so they'll take eighth inch burrs, which is the most common size for gourd carvers. Yes, in, in the United States. And, and yes. I, what I found out is in China and Korea, the, the 332nds is the most popular. That's thing. still the standard in a lot of places and also in the nail industry, which where they're used quite a bit. And you talked about using a burr that wasn't rated for the right RPMs, right? And Correct. I've had the head of a burr fly off on me before or twist and break. And yeah, I've yeah. seen people that have burrs where the shank is bent because they had it protruding too far out of their tool and they turned it on too high and it created such torque that the shaft actually bent. Yep, and that's a, that's a scary thing. I, I, <laughs> I've had a couple of close calls where the burr went flying off. And yes. I'm lucky it wasn't flying towards my eye. So that's that's a really good point there. And so the dental drills, they only take the one sixteenth of a shank dental burr. Yes. So that they're very limited on what you can do there. So that means most of their carving is very small, detailed work. If you're if you're a tool junkie and you you have unlimited funds, you could own many, many more tools, even than what's shown here. But I think the trick is for people to find out what their budget is and what they can do uh, the most things with. And if, if I was to advise a beginner now about what to buy, I would tell them if, if budget is a concern and you want a good all round tool to purchase either a Dremel tool with a flex shaft um, or a micromotor tool. Uh, yeah. They're both good and they'll do a lot of things. Yeah, I get I get asked that quite a bit, you know, from people what tool they should start out with, and and I'm kind of the same way. So it's almost come to right now, like if you buy a Dremel, I can't remember what is it, four thousand or forty four hundred, whatever their Dremel, the hanging brand, right, the hanging motor, and you but you buy that, and I think that's around eighty bucks, and then the flex shaft, which is around thirty bucks, and then you almost gotta have the um, Chuckless call it, which is about another 30 bucks. So, I mean, you, just to get started in a Dremel these days, you're getting close to about 150 bucks. And this yeah. micro motor tool here, it's come down in price. I've seen those as low as 175. Yeah. But yeah, I, I agree. The only difference between the two in my mind is that the Dremel does have a little bit more torque than the um, micro motors, a little bit. And a Dremel is probably better if you want something that is also good for household use, like I've used it for home repairs and things. So it depends on what you're trying to do with your tools. Yeah. And the Dremel's nice because they can go to their local hardware store and just pick it up. Yeah. Right? So, And not to diss Dremel, because there is some people doing some awesome work with Dremels, no doubt about it. Um, so when you carve, uh, where is your workspace? Do you have a dedicated area, a dedicated shop or, or? I do. If you want, I can actually show you. Oh, um, that'd be it's, wonderful. It's actually just, <laughs> you're going to laugh. Everybody thinks I have a fancy studio. I'm going to walk over here. No, I can see it, Bonnie. So that it looks like you got a, you got an old desk there. And yeah, it's actually an old bureau that I cut the center out of. Okay. An old you know, bedroom dresser, I cut the center out of. Each drawer is wired for power. And so I store my, my tools in the different drawers. I have some on the top, of course, as you can see. Uh, I got my air compressor down below that I use for various things. Um, it's certainly not fancy. So are, is it, are you outside on a patio or something? Yes, I'm on a covered patio. 
Here in Arizona, we're very fortunate in that we can work year round. In the summer, I have a small portable swamp cooler that lets me sit out here and work comfortably. And in the winter time, if I really need it, which isn't often, I have a small um, pancake shaped disc heater that I bought at Harbor Freight for 20 bucks. And that provides enough warmth. It doesn't get that cold here. So with being outside, you probably don't have to worry about dust collection quite as much, right? You put no, that's why I work outside because yeah, it's too messy nice. to really want to do in the house. Very nice. I mean, if you look at the desk, you can see it's pretty dirty looking. And yeah, well, I was good. working on the kitchen counter for years and my husband finally said, that's it, you're moving out to the porch, so. All right, so let's talk about the burrs you use on gourds. Um, can you go ahead and just kind of run through what you use on gourds and is there anything special about the burrs you use on gourds compared to what you'd use on wood? Um, okay, uh, no, basically the wood carving burrs work great on gourds because we're basically carving on the same surface anyway. There's a few exceptions and I'll, I'll mention those, but the burrs that you show in the top center are burrs that are made by Sabretooth. Uh, and the one in the middle there might be a Cutsall burr. I can't really tell from the photo. Sabretooth burrs and Cutsall burrs and Fordham Typhoon burrs and there's a few Dremel ones, are what they call structured tooth burrs. And they're a steel burr that is covered in carbide teeth. And unlike traditional burrs, which are showed a little farther down, they don't have um, teeth like we recognize them. They're more like spikes that stick straight out. And they are wonderful for people who are left-handed because they will carve in forward or reverse. Whereas burrs that are like the third picture down, the silver ones in the middle, right here, those are teeth uh, more traditional where you can see a spiral on them. And those do not work well for left-handed people. Hmm. Um, so I use the saber tooth burrs a lot. They, they cut quickly and they remove a lot of material uh, cleanly and uh, you do get a little bit of teeth marks, so I don't use them for a final finish, but for actual removal of the material, they are wonderful. And then I'll just quickly say about the saber tooth for those people that don't know, the different colors represent different grits, I guess, kind of, right? So orange is, I believe, coarse, and the yellow would be fine, right? And the green would be in between the two. Yeah, they actually offer other other colors and coarsenesses. They just came out with a white one called a whisper burr that's even finer than the yellow. And there's ones above the orange that are blue and purple that are super aggressive. But in general for gourd carvers, I wouldn't go any coarser than the green one. Um, I, I generally use the yellow ones for 95% of my work. Yeah, and they're great burrs. I haven't had a chance to try the Whisper yet. I don't own one of those, but I imagine they're just as good as all the other stuff that Sabretooth makes. Yeah, they're nice. I don't see a huge difference between the white and the yellow. Um, not enough that I've, I would go out and purchase one of every one to try. Um, you might buy one of those in a different shape than something you already own just to give it a shot and see how you like it. Most of my burrs are yellow with a few green ones. Now the ones just below that that you show that are gold colored are yeah. made by Duragrit, a Canadian company. Those are also a steel burr that has been coated in carbide, but instead of the teeth like you see on the burrs above, those are coated in carbide grit. So they are generally finer cutting, generally. Um, and they will also clog a little bit easier if, if you don't keep them clean. And there's certain specific ones that I, I like. I don't use a lot of them, but I use a long pointed burr, which uh, is great for doing filigree. I use uh, some of the inverted cone shapes because I do a lot of work with those. Um, and I have a, a small wheel cutting shape that I use just personal preference. Um, and then the picture below that are an inexpensive set of 
uh, carbide burrs that are called double cut burrs. They have the traditional spiral cut that you might see in a regular Dremel burr, but then they've been cross hatched going the opposite direction. And that makes them also suitable for left-handed people. They will cut in forward or reverse. And a lot of times my method of carving is to actually go back and forth with my hand as I'm carving with the pull towards me stage being the cut and the push away stage being the smoothing out. So, and those, those you can buy many, many places. Um, they're actually cheaper if you buy them in a set than if you go and try to buy them individually. You can buy, I used to have Arizona Gourds. They still sell them. You can buy them on Amazon. You can buy them on eBay, lots of different sources. But if you buy a set, you'll get a better price than if you buy them individually. And then below, uh, I'm trying to see what you've got there. Those are dental burrs. Yeah. These okay. are the and den dental burrs come in steel and carbide and, and diamond. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about diamond in a second. Those are for very fine detailing. Um, I use those a lot for egg carving, but I also do use them on gourds. Even if they're not in my Shofu tool, you can use them in a micromotor if you have a 16th inch collet adapter. Yep. And then over to the left are diamond burrs and Diamond burrs are like a diamond nail file uh, that you might have seen that's silver in color. It's a metal base with very fine diamond grit, and the grit will clog very easily if you use it on the gourd skin. It's not meant for going through resinous kind of materials, and the gourd skin has almost a sap in it that will clog those burrs. So what I do with them is I carve through the skin first using traditional burrs, and then I use them in that softer, drier, pulpier meat of the gourd, the whiter colored area. And I use them mainly for sanding, but I do some basic carving with them as well. Yeah, I think so. We're, uh, I think you covered, let's see, pretty much everything I wanted to ask there. Um, I'm glad you brought up the gourd skin so let's take this picture up here on, on the top right um i want to mention that the gourd skin is pretty unique in itself right because from my experience the gourd skin is almost like you can almost kind of treat it like leather or something and then underneath is the the more wood pulp i don't know it's just a harder surface it's a very thin layer and a hard surface you can tell when you're through the skin, like in that picture where it's dark brown, that is the skin, and where it's white, that's the inner pulp. And that's actually a great feature to provide contrast in your gourd design to have that difference between the dark skin and the lighter inner pulp. Yep, and why we got this picture here, I, I wanted people to just kind of notice how thick that gourd is. How, how thick do you think that is, close to an inch? No, 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 not anywhere near that thick. Actually, that gourd, I would guess, is probably no more than a quarter of an inch. Oh, okay. But that, that is a quarter of an inch after it has been really well cleaned, all the loose material inside. So sometimes you might open a gourd up and it might look like it's going to be a half inch thick. But when you grind away all that loose pulp material, it turns out to be thinner. I, I consider a gourd that's quarter of an inch thick or more to be ideal for carving. Okay. So yeah, I guess we didn't mention that earlier that, that gourds, before you, um, you have to prepare them for carving or preparing for any kind of craft, but it's kind of like a pumpkin, right? You cut, yes. you cut the top off and inside it's full of seeds, except for it's a little tougher to remove than a pumpkin, in my opinion. It's full of seeds and then it's also got a lot of the mem membrane and that's what I'm talking about, cleaning out the pulp. It's almost like a white, shiny, papery surface in some gourds. And if you don't clean that out and say you want to paint the inside of the gourd, the paint will not take the same on that pulpy area and it'll look shiny instead of the same as the rest. And then also with any handling, it will continue to flake off over the years. And so it looks less attractive if you don't clean it out well to start with. 
And this gourd here, it looks like you've spray painted or something the inside of it. Yes, I use cheap dollar cans of spray paint that you can find at places like uh, Home Depot, Lowe's, Walmart. And generally what they do is they place the dollar cans down low on the floor so that your eye goes right to the $8 cans of spray paint. But the dollar cans of spray paint are just as good for what we're doing. And you can do, you know, three or four gourds uh, completely paint the inside so it doesn't cost you very much. And the ideal thing for me about spray painting over other methods is that if you try to put a water-based paint inside of the gourd, think of the gourd as wood. And what happens when you soak a piece of wood? It, it swells. And then when it dries, it contracts and it splits and it cracks. And the same thing can happen with the gourd. When you put water inside of it, the gourd pulp swells up and can crack. So by spraying with spray paint, that's a solvent-based paint, and it will not cause that problem. This is my absolute favorite slide because- Thank you. This, this, this is, first of all, your photos are terrific. And, uh, and for the listeners that are watching this, uh, Bonnie just has great photos and content on her Facebook page and her website and Instagram. And not only does she have great finished photos, but a lot of in-process photos too. And, and this one here, I, I really like. So you've got the finished carved gourd here. And then it appears that you have done some wood burning to add details here and then the painted part. Well, okay, here, right? so it's a little bit of fool the eye, I guess. The finished painting on the left, or the finished board, excuse me, the unfinished board on the far left is yeah. the natural board. And I debated, you know, a lot of times I see the finished carving and I think, oh, I really like how it looks as a carving. Should I paint it or should I not? Well, in this case, if you look at the middle picture, mm -hmm. the lattice was actually uh, painted with a whitewash and oh. then everything was covered with a very watered down thin brown stain to pick up the highlights in the, in the uh, carving and to pick up the highlights on the lattice area. And I debated about just leaving the gourd as was, but ultimately I thought, you know, I think it's gonna look a lot better with some color. So I did no wood burning to speak of on that gourd. It's mostly just highlights you're seeing from the stain in the carving. I see, so the stain gets down into the deep areas and then that adds shadow or whatever in, uh, through the paint, right? Right, when you wipe it off, it, like if you put a stain on and then you wipe it off, it's going to sink into the deep areas and then it's going to be removed from the highlights and only show those carved deep areas. Nice. And that uh, with that being said, I, I notice you have pre-seal there. After yeah. I'm done with the carving, if I were to paint that carving with acrylic paints, what would ha happen is the water in the acrylic paints would cause the fibers of the board to raise up and make the surface a little fuzzy. And after you've spent a lot of work sanding, you don't really want to have a fuzzy board. So I usually seal all carved areas with lacquer sanding sealer. And that means when I put the paint on, it's not going to soak in the same way and the surface will stay smooth. So the paint does soak in slightly though, right? Or does it just stay on top? Um, I don't use a heavy coat of sealer. It soaks in somewhat, but not as much as if it was just seeping down directly into the pulp and raising the fibers. Then I use, you mentioned that you use acrylic paints. Is that was like I, I like acrylic paints. They are the most permanent color there is. Even oil paints will fade over time dyes definitely will fade over time, especially out here in Arizona where our sun is so intense. Whereas if I took that gourd, that particular gourd that you're looking at, the brown background is dye. Everything else is acrylic. So if I took that gourd and I sat it in my backyard for two or three days, that brown dye would start to fade, whereas the acrylic paint would stay bright forever. And when you say acrylics, is that artist acrylics or is it the, um, the kind of the thinner stuff that comes in the bottles? 
I, I've used everything from cheap craft paints to uh, sometimes if it's a particular color where I really want to have good quality and intensity, I'll buy golden paint um, or some other artist brand paint. The cheaper the paint, the less pigment that it has, and it can be very transparent sometimes. Like if you've ever tried to paint um, a bright yellow, uh, several times you might have to put on three or four or five coats and build it up to get the color you want. The more expensive paints with more pigment will cover better. And then, and then do you, I believe you said you sealed this when you're done painting, right or not? Yes, I do. I use, uh, if I'm going to use dyes, I use uh, trans tint, which are a wood carver's uh, woodworking dye. They're alcohol based. And when you spray those with lacquer, which is what I use, um, the lacquer and the dye melds together, literally melds together, provides a nice surface, and it's a great sealer for the acrylic area as well. Now, just one caveat is that a lot of people are using the solvent-based dyes that are made for rubber stamps. The uh, Memories brand or the Gordmaster brand, those are a solvent base that is not compatible with lacquer. So if you want to use dyes with lacquer, they need to be an alcohol-based dye. Did you say that, is that a spray lacquer or a brush on? Yeah, I just use spray lacquer. Okay. And uh, one thing I, I want to say a little something about this carving. I was going, when I was going through your Facebook page, I want to say something about these square holes. And if I understood this right, you carve those by punching a round hole in there with a bit, right? And then yeah, you, you can do that. Those off square. Mm -hmm. Wow. You can, you can you cannot make a square hole with a round burr. You're yeah. going to have to either use a file or a knife to do it. I actually just came out with a project packet called Contemporary Bird, where I talk about how to carve square holes. No, so it's it's a challenge. Oh, you're right. That is where I've seen that because I own that packet. Yes, right here. Yay! Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't the Facebook page. It was that. So, all right. We'll talk about the packets a little bit later down the road. All right. So, as you mentioned earlier, you have these wood carved lids and decorations on top and. I think those are just incredibly awesome. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you really go the extra mile with your gourd. So, I mean, I, I mean, just the gourd carving alone is beautiful. And then you go and make this awesome lid. Can you just talk a little bit about those? Sure. Well, like I said, I come into the gourds as having a wood background. And in addition to wood carving for years, I did dollhouse miniatures and I purchased a dollhouse size lathe and I turned finials and that got me interested in looking at wood turnings and seeing what they did with lids and that gave me some ideas. But the, the biggest thing is when most people cut a lid on their gourd, their biggest problem is getting the lid to fit back on when they're done. Either they cut it with a saw blade that has a thick kerf and removes a lot of material and then the lid wants to drop in or they cut it and they have to continually wiggle it around and around until they find the place where it fits properly. I found that to be really annoying. So with these lids, I've made them so they're perfectly round and so the lid can go on in any direction, will always sit well and, and look nice when you're done. Yeah, and man, they just make them pop in my opinion. Now, the picture to the right, I, that was actually taken for a demonstration that I did at the gallery I show at. I was trying to show people some of the step-by-step -step process that goes into carving a bird, which is what I used to do for years before I got into gourds. And basically, you're starting out with a block of wood, and you're drawing a side profile and a top profile on a piece of wood, cutting it out with a bandsaw, and then you're reducing it down with carving to get it to the shape of the bird. Yeah, and 
and that makes that makes kind of a statement for me on a lot of my gourds because it's something that not many people do and that's just kind of my signature thing anymore yeah i love it um and also uh, briefly let me just say i'm also inspired a lot by native american pottery and the couple of those lids shown there like the one in the middle with the corn shaped lid on the top is definitely influenced by native american pottery and i want to thank all those potters for giving me some great ideas yeah that's a beautiful piece too all right so i want to talk about the american gourd society um I, I got their mission statement up there and i'll read that off real quick uh, the American Gourd Society promotes interest in all activities related to gourds, cultivating and artistic shape man manipulation, historical uses, gourd show, competition, craft work, and artist decoration. So I imagine there's going to be a lot of people listening to this interview that's not familiar with the Gourd Society and they may not even know it exists at all. Um, I can't remember how I f stumbled across it, but I, I just... I really like it because, well, I'll, I'll let you talk more about it. Can you talk about how it's structured and how it works? Sure, the American Gourd Society has been around a long, long, long time. I don't remember offhand what year it was formed, but it was a long time ago, back in the 50s maybe. Um, and for a long time, they were the only thing out there. Well, now we have you know, other groups with the pro proliferation of Facebook and things like that, there's lots of places to go. But this is the unifying whole for all the state societies and the local board clubs. And the two biggest things that they do that are of benefit are the Gord Magazine, which you have a picture of the cover there. Uh, the Gord Magazine, when I started in the organization, was a black and white uh, picture pictures were all black and white, a very thin pamphlet on newsprint. And over the years, it's morphed into a beautiful full color magazine. And each issue has tutorials and things about gourd growing and things about gourd crafting and art. We also sponsor uh, contests for both gourd manipulation and, and artistic gourd things. So that's the first real perk of our group. The second real perk is that we are, um, we have developed a judging standards book and we're trying to unify so that all state cap competitions will be on the same page as far as how they judge gourds uh, in art competitions. We also sponsor a couple of national awards. Yeah, so I, I love the Gourd Magazine. So it's a quarterly magazine. So that's four times a year it comes out. And I, I just absolutely, when I get it in the mail, it, it's a very happy moment for me because I get a cup of coffee and I sit down and I go through the whole thing. And just like you said, the full page color photos are just incredible. And, and I love watching the competitions and um, so yeah. And, and so also I want to talk about how it's structured. So there's, and correct me if I'm wrong, but there's look, so the idea is like in this photo here, there's little gourd patches, right? Throughout the state. That's yeah, local, a, local clubs, basically. Local clubs where people get together and they talk about gourds, they do workshops and basically just hang out and, and do gourds. So then, one state might have multiple gourd patches, right? That's right. And then there's a state chapter for the state. And I, I believe in the last magazine I counted somewhere around, we got about 22 states maybe, or maybe closer to half all the states involved in the gourd society. Something like that. And unfortunately- yeah, states where they don't grow gourds don't have a chapter, unfortunately. Well, Illinois, has had and then now they don't so they've been off and on but currently there's not one in illinois um missouri's got a pretty active state chapter it, it's like any other volunteer group it's only as good as its volunteers and some states go through cycles up and down so i hereby nominate you to be 
chapter president for the newly reinstated Illinois Gord Patch or Gord Chapter. We, we had a small Gord Patch um, started here uh, over by Bishop Hill, not too far from where I live, but uh, it's since faded out. But yes, it, it probably needs to be looked at again. <laughs> And then, so there's also gourd festivals, right? And yes, um, most states have some kind of a gourd festival. Some gourd festivals are run by growers. Okay, so I, I, I attended um, the one in your state, the, the Arizona State Gourd Festival, which was back in two years ago, February. I believe. I got to go to that and Man, was I impressed. It was a lot more than I thought it would be. The Words Festival is the largest festival out there. And part of the reason for that is that it is a gourd growers festival. It is run by the Wirtz family that run the Wirtz gourd farm. And so they take care of all the logistical things as far as hiring uh, food people to come in and entertainment and uh, providing vendor space. And so they're taking care of the major part of the work. The Arizona Gore Society only runs the competition. Okay. Whereas you go to other state chapters and those same volunteers are trying to fill all of those roles. So if you go to the Texas Gore Society, for example, all the things that the Wirtz family is doing now falls upon the state chapters. So their show is going to be perhaps a little bit smaller because there's a limited number of volunteers. Okay. So here, here's a picture of a kind of a competition at one of the festivals. And yeah, I can't tell, maybe, maybe Georgia, I'm not really sure where that is. Yeah, I don't really remember either, but I remember when I went to the one there in Arizona, just being totally amazed at what people were doing with gourds. And uh, the level of work in gourds has gone up exponentially since I got started in it and started observing it. My very first show was in Indiana. Um, I would say it was probably in the late 90s. And the festival itself was wonderful. I was thrilled. But since then, the art that you see has changed now that the internet has made people realize what else is out there where else they can buy materials. Like at, in Indiana, there really weren't that many carved boards because they didn't have thick boards there. I went to North Carolina and I brought one of my gourds with me to show and people looked at it and said, is that a gourd? I've never seen a gourd so thick. So now that people know there's thick boards out there, they're buying them mail order and, and now the same art is being done all across the nation. Yeah, so yeah, for listeners out there, if you hear Gord Festival, you're probably thinking, you know, birdhouses and whatever, jack-o'-lanterns, man, there is so much more, so much more. Yeah, the nice thing too is if you attend a festival, there's so many people there that you can visit with about their advice on what tools they like, um, you know, share stuff with people, stories about what you're doing, get ideas. It, it's really a great event. And, and the classes, right? So Yes, lots of classes. Hands-on classes. So what I, what I found out is when I was, it was kind of a last minute thing about me going to the Arizona um, festival. And so, yeah, it, it, the classes were sold out <laughs> within hours of it opening. I was amazed. I, I couldn't believe it. And yeah, it, yours, it varies were definitely the, to state. yours was de definitely the first ones to be sold out, Bonnie. So congratulations there. Oh, thanks. Well, I've taught for a lot of years and I've kind of developed a reputation from, you know, doing it for so long, but there's lots of other good art teachers out there as well. Yep. So, and then I, I just want to just bring up that the membership to the American Gourd Society is only $20 a year. And you know, that includes the magazines and, and all this knowledge. So, and even if you're not into carving gourds, I would say if you're a wood carver or even into antler or whatever else, there's still a lot of material that translates over. Would you not agree? Of course, like, like I say, I borrow ideas from all different mediums because we're all doing similar things. Yeah, so 
spend the twenty dollars if you're a carver and, and just get that magazine and see what it's all about. I want to talk about um, your roles as author and teacher. So we got your book here, and I own a copy of that book right here. Yay! <laughs> yeah. So if you want to talk about your book and and um, how it came to be, what's inside of it, and just kind of the history of where the book started. Sure. Uh, back in the early 2000s, late 90s probably, uh, the internet really wasn't what it is today. I remember back when I first got started in boards, I still used a dial-up modem, and whenever I was on the computer, my phone didn't work, you know, so that it was pretty rudimentary on the net. But I wanted to share with other board people, so I made a small website and I put pictures on there of what I was doing. And I thought, why would anybody look at this website? There's others out there. Well, maybe if I put on something there educational, they'll want to come for that and then they'll look at the other stuff. So I put a few basic tutorials on that initial website. And after a couple of years, I got a letter from a publishing house and they said, we've seen your webpage. We think you can write, we'd like you to write a book. And as I told you before, my husband's the one that talked me into doing it. Um, and we had different goals, the publisher and I, on what we wanted to do. They wanted a basic craft book that anybody could go pick up and make some you know, basic crafts. But I also wanted to teach people new techniques so that they could do other things beyond the basic project. So they had me write, I think, 20, 25 chapters of different projects. And it took me a year to do it. And when they were all done, they picked out what they wanted and they had about eight projects left over. And they said, well, we can't fit these in. So that's the birth of the project packets, basically. Um, but the book itself, I, it starts out from the simplest projects in the beginning and they become progressively more difficult as you go back towards the back of the book. So I was trying to make it appeal to a wide audience the introductory chapters have the basics, and then there's stuff for people that are a little more advanced towards the back. Yeah, and, I, and we talked earlier about cleaning the gourds and drying the gourds, and all that's in here, right? I, yes. Yeah, it's, it's very thorough. And, and I chuckled a little bit earlier because you said it was, they wanted 25 chapters, and you said it took you a year to do that. <laughs> that that's still impressive. It, it would have took me three years to do that. Well, I treated it like a full-time job. I was actually yeah. working as a floral designer at the time, and I quit my job, and I worked on it all day, every day, for about a year. Um, and it, it saved me time having my husband be the photographer, but you still have to take the time to develop and come up with each project and put it all together. I can do it a lot faster now than I could back then. I've learned a lot. Um, but like I said, the leftover projects i thought to myself well do i save these packets and write some more and do another book and i just decided you know what i think i'm going to try selling them individually because maybe people want to just try one out rather than pay for a whole book and it turned out to be very very popular people like the idea of if i just want to learn filigree i can just buy the filigree project or you know, if you want to learn something that's more recent than from when the book was first published, they can just get an individual one. So it's worked out well for me. Yeah, I got three of the packets here. And, um, and so I will, I, I want to mention that, you know, they, it's like the book, you know, it's written like the book with the pictures and stuff. And it's got what, good color photos and good instructions. I, I like them a lot, and for what and for what you're charging, which is around what, ten bucks, twelve bucks, or something like that. Ten, ten bucks is the most expensive. I think yeah. they're from anywhere from four to ten dollars. I try to do them inexpensively so that people can feel they can afford them, and that they're not tempted to just photo photocopy them and share them with their friends, um, which I really appreciate when people respect the copyright because I'm not charging that much for them. 
and I hope you'll come and buy them from me because this is how I make my living. Yeah, it's it's definitely well worth uh, what you pay for. Okay, so I've jumped over uh, to your website and okay. I'm looking at the, the project packets. And first of all, there's quite a range, right? You've got some new ones here that looks like just came out. Yeah, there's some there that are from the original book all the way up to the newest ones. So figure that's about 20 years worth of different projects. And they, they just a lot of different things, right? There's carving, they're yes. using clay. My specialty really is carving, but I do projects on other subjects as well. There's, there's a wood carving of a spoon even. Yeah, um, riverbed gourd. <clears throat> I like that. Another thing about the project packets is that I've noticed that some people will see an idea and they'll do one gourd and then they'll go out and teach it. And unfortunately, if you do that, a student will ask you a question and it'll be hard to answer because maybe you haven't run into that project. So I usually try to make at least you know, three to six boards before I ever write a project packet. And that way I can work through any issues that might come up along the way. And also it gives me plenty of material to photograph for people to see different examples of the same project. Very nice. So I would imagine right now, seeing how COVID's kind of put a halt to most classes, I'd imagine. Are you seeing an uptick in people buying the packets? I think I'm seeing an uptick mainly because <clears throat> this year I've come out with at least five or six new projects. Whereas in an average year, I would say I'm lucky to put out two because of the time it takes to write them and I'm off teaching or doing things. This year I've had more time to write more. So yes, there are some people that come up to me and they say, I own every project you've ever done. And then there's other people that say, I just want to buy this one packet and I'm happy to help them both. So personally, that's kind of what I did. I went on here and I seen that, well, of course I bought the one about carving because that's what I do. But this one here using clay on gourds, I've seen it done and I've always wanted to try it, but honestly, I. I'm pretty dumb when it comes to using clay. That okay. particular project is more like what would go in a book because it has a lot of different information about different kinds of clay and what their properties are and what purposes they're best used for. So that's a little different than some of the other packages. That's exactly what I needed. So, you know, I didn't even know what clay to even start with. So I'm looking forward to diving a little bit more into that one. I'm going to jump over to your class schedule here and whoops I'm sorry. Yeah it looks pretty sad doesn't it? Yeah so yeah let's talk about that I mean canceled due to coronavirus canceled due to coronavirus I mean that's pretty much all the way down the line there and uh, let's, let's can you talk a little bit about how that's affecting you and the American Gourd Society? Oh, it's affecting everybody across the nation in so many different ways. And that was part of the reason why I started writing the project packets because all these classes got taught and people still need an outlet to do things. And so at least they can do this on their own. There are some groups that are starting to meet and have uh, socially distanced classes with reduced attendance, that sort of thing. I know a few patches have done that. I don't feel comfortable teaching yet, and that's mainly because my father's 93, and I don't want to take any risk of uh, exposing myself and then having to wait for two weeks to go see him. So I've elected not to teach for right now. We'll see how things go in the future. Yeah. Yeah, i am still got my fingers crossed that things will lighten up enough or... No, we all hope so. <laughs> Because I think the um, the Missouri State Gourd Show, the Show Me State, or the Show Me Gourd Show, or whatever, I think that's in April. Now I'm really hoping I can make it down to that. Yeah, I think I think the Works Festival is still planning as of now to go ahead. They're doing a uh, basic 
we're waiting and see if we have to, we can cancel. But as far as I know, they're planning to have it in February. So there are still going to be some things, hopefully that'll happen, but you know, it's just kind of a day-to-day -day thing. Um, we all have to kind of wait and see when it really truly is, is good. As you know, probably from experience, most of our people that are in hobbies, oh. did you lose me there? I lost your video. I can hear you fine. Okay, hang there on. You Let's... You're back. Okay, sorry about that. I was just going to say most of the most of our population that do hobbies are doing them because they're retired and they now have time. And so most board people are, you know, 60 and above, which are, are the more risk uh, prone kind of population. So that it's been prudent to not have any this year. Yeah, and that's part of the reason I, I'm doing this interview using Zoom and, and uh, the PowerPoint and everything is my, during the day I'm, I, I'm an engineer and because of coronavirus now I'm working from home and all my communication is through online meetings and conference calls and of course almost everything I do I always kind of see how I can relate that back to carving and whatever so I'm kind of learning my day jobs kind of teaching me how to do this but I'm, I'm I, I miss the classes and going to events and art shows and different things and so I think is, we all do this is kind of filling a gap for me too so so when you do normally do gourd classes is it just at the uh, gourd festivals or do you do other other places and other events as well no, I've been teaching mostly to private groups, uh, like a gourd patch in, in one state might say, hey, we want to have a class just for our gourd society, and can you come and do a class? So I've taught in Idaho and California and Georgia and, you know, all over the place for sometimes at festivals, but sometimes just for a local group. Um, I also teach at my house. Um, I have a very active club here in Tucson. And every now and then, like maybe twice a year, I'll have a weekend where I do classes that are just for locals. So when you do a larger class, how many people usually attend something like that? Well, I prefer only to have 12. That's how many I have at my house. But when I go to a festival, the classes are, are pretty popular. And because I've traveled from a distance and there's so many that want to take it, I ended up expanding them to 20 as a max. Um, and I, if possible, I try to get an assistant to help me at those classes, but I've taught them for so many years now that I'm pretty good at having the class go forward, even with that many people. Um, it, it, it took a while. The first few classes I taught, I just really didn't have a clue what I was doing. And I learned over the years what works and how fast I need to move on to make sure projects get done in a timely manner. And, I try to go around to each person in class and give them one-on-one -on -one attention. So it, that's what has worked for me. I just started teaching a few classes in the last couple of years. And yeah, that's been a learning experience. Um, what, what I realized is, you know, I've been carving for quite a while. So like things that I take for granted, and uh, I totally forget <laughs> that most people don't understand, you know? Yeah. Just as simple as how a burr works and how to put it into the handpiece and and stuff like that. Yeah, I, an interesting story. I had a lady come to a class one time and she asked if her husband could stay. And I said, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, we, we don't really have enough chairs. It, does he not have any place to go? And she says, no. She says, I need him to be here to change my burrs for me. Hmm. And I said, I'm sorry, your husband can't stay. He has to go. And by the end of the day, she says, I feel so empowered. I never was able to carve unless my husband was there to change. And it's like, okay, great. I felt really, really good about that, that she finally felt like she could do it on her own. Wow. Okay. So as I said in the beginning, um, you're also a businesswoman besides an artist and, and a wife and a mother. Um, that's got to be a little bit of a, a task to, to balance all that out, right? I'm, and 
Well, it's been in stages. So I didn't really start in Gourds until my kids both graduated from high school. Because okay. before that, while I did do hobbies, I was the band booster president and I was the president of a local miniature club because I did dollhouse scale miniatures. Um, so I didn't really get into Gourds until after they were grown. In fact, my son asked me, why, why didn't you uh, do gourds when I was younger, Mom? And so, well, because I was being your Boy Scout leader or whatever. <laughs> my, my, I got two boys, and, and they're high school age now, uh, sophomore and senior. So, mm -hmm. I have a very, very supportive husband. Um, he retired when he was 68, and what, like I said, encouraged me to write the book. And then because he was retired at that point, he was free to go with me when I taught classes. So the longer I taught classes, the more I realized I can't teach this class if people don't have what they need burr-wise. So I started buying burrs and bringing the classes and he would be my little shopkeeper kind of thing. Um, and the business, I just had a business, ArizonaGords.com that grew out of that. He did not have anything to do with the business. Um, other than helping me at classes, uh, but he provided all that necessary background support um, that made me succeed. Yeah, that has to be just a huge help. It was. It was. It was great. My my wife has a lot of respect for my carving and stuff that I do, but she's not actively involved. She's got her own thing, and I got mine. Yeah, yeah. Well, he he was retired, and like most retired men. He needed something to do to keep him. He was an emergency room physician. Can you imagine going from that super busy, high stress thing to all of a sudden you're home? Uh, so this was a good outlet for him to, to go to shows and things with me and help out. So Arizona Gourds, the website, the online store, it's still out there, right? And yes, it, it is. I, I sold it about two years ago. And the new people, Aura and Lee Jacobson, live in Washington State, and they still run it. It's still online with the same basic layout and supplies. Yeah, so that's that's boarding supplies, right? That includes yes. tools and, and different things, embellishments. and. Yep. Well, that was it. Like I said, I taught my first class, and I had no carving burrs with me other than my own box. And people came to class, and this was at the beginning of carving. And I said, you have to have a Dremel tool. So I would say three quarters of the students had gone to Home Depot the night before and bought a, a Dremel tool. They didn't know how to put them together. They didn't have burrs. So I started buying and selling the burrs just as self-preservation in order to do a decent class. Kind of grew from there. So this picture here in the middle, um, that looks like you're at some, is it a museum or? No, that's actually the Red Door Gallery in Tubac, Arizona. And they are my, currently my only representation for my uh, art board. So I take them down there. I don't like going to craft shows and I don't want to do production work like many people do. I want to make one of a kind art pieces. And so a gallery is a good fit for me. Yes, I pay them a lot in commission to do it, but I don't have to own the gallery. I don't have to sit there all day. I can be home working and doing something fun. Nice. So have you ever used Etsy or any of those types of platforms to sell gourds? No, I never have, never have. I know it's out there. Um, I was so busy with my own Arizona Gourds website, I didn't want to take on another yeah. thing at that point. Yeah, I totally understand it. All right, so this is uh, some of my gourd carvings. Um, yeah, they're lovely. Oh, thank you. And <laughs> that means a lot coming from you. So, I mean, one thing, you know, when I was building this presentation and going through preparing for the interview, I mean, I noticed right away, like, this gourd here and this gourd here very much resemble something that you have done or, or could do. So I, I, you've definitely influenced me. And I hope I'm not plagiarizing in any way, but you no, definitely not influenced me. They look great. And, um, 
and going through here, you know, I, I that's one of the reasons I, I like doing these interviews and stuff because it helps me learn myself. Um, I, I like my, you know, you have a lot of um, designs and decorations around the carvings where mine are kind of boring in that way. There's nothing much going on up around here and through there. So I think that's something I could add to my stuff. No, well, that's just personal preference. Everybody likes something different, which is what makes the world interesting. <laughs> um, I like how on the, the deer and the sunflower picture, you've actually extended your subject matter beyond your border. That's very attractive. That's something I've done in most of my wood carvings too. And I don't know why I started doing, actually, you know why I started doing that is because I found, I, I used to do a lot of gun stock carvings and, mm -hmm. and using the Dremel tool, making a really long straight line, I couldn't do it. It'd have wobble in it. So that's why I like to chop them up. So that's why I started extending stuff out beyond that. So these outside border lines wouldn't be so long. Sure. But thank you. And it also gives you a place to attach things when you're doing the, the intricate cutout work like you've done. Right, right. So yeah, the, yeah, I, most of my stuff, I, I cut out the negative backgrounds. That's kind of just what I like to do. And same when I do antler carvings also. No, they're very nice. Good job. Thank you, Bonnie. So wrapping it up here, um, let's just finish off. Do you have any funny or odd stories you, that goes along with your carvings and your artwork that you'd like to share? Oh, I don't know. The story I gave you about the lady changing the burrs was probably the funniest. Um, uh, the other stories about uh, people that get their hair caught in their Dremel tool and things. Oh my. Those, those bring up a point that I want to mention that you need to use basic common sense and safety when you're doing carving. Be sure to wear a respirator, some kind of eye protection. Um, I wish I had started out wearing ear protection much earlier. I'm starting to get a little deaf in one ear and it, I'm sure that all these years of listening to tools hasn't helped. Um, just use common sense. It's a pretty safe hobby unless you do something really stupid. So, <laughs> but and, protect uh, your lungs for sure. Yeah, and gourds, just because of the way they dry out, it's common for mold and whatever to be in there, right? So I would yeah, say- Yeah, I, I have less problems with the carving than with the cleaning of the gourds. Yep. especially when you clean gourds, wear that mask because you don't want to breathe in mold spores. Yeah, yep, I agree. Very important. And then, um, do you have any other advice for anybody starting out, just starting out carving? Um, I'd say start with tools that you have on hand if possible, and then try to add a few things a little bit at a time. Don't run out and buy $200 worth of carving burrs. Start out buying one or two. Find out what you need um, rather than make a huge investment because sometimes you'll find that, you know, hey, maybe carving isn't for you. You'd rather put your money into wood burning tools. So I, I just generally tell people to get the bare minimum of what they need, find out if they like it, and then add to it as they go along. And, and to keep organized, um, I would like to just, if I can for a second, show my basic burr box. Sure. Is that possible here? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, let's see. I can't see what I'm showing you. Are you able to see my burr box? Yep, I can see it there, yep. Okay, it's, it's dirty and dusty, but it's organized. So if you look here, I have all my diamonds in one area. And if, these are all my structure two carbides. And these are my regular carbides. And these are all my fine engraving burrs. So they're, they're put in sections, which means when I'm carving, if I need a burr, I know right where to go to get it. 
Yeah. Whereas my students come to class and they have two or three Altoids tins and they have a couple of boxes of the Dremel stuff and they can never find what they're looking for. And this is, this is most of the burrs that I use every day. I have a few others that aren't in the picture, but I've had students come and they have the equivalent of about four or five boxes like this. And half of their burrs should just be thrown in the trash because they're so old and rusted. They have no teeth left on them. So get rid of the ex extra stuff and get yourself a good basic burr box where you can stand them up. I'm gonna move the, the camera here. Sure. Get a good basic burr box where you can stand them up and see what you actually have so that you can waste less time hunting and searching for that burr that you're looking for. Yeah, and from my experience, I kind of did the same thing. I started off with buying almost every burr that was out there. And then I, you know, I went from that big, huge, massive burrs, and then I ended up just focusing down to five, maybe 10 burrs that I use 95% of the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I call those my, uh, I guess, the kind of core burrs. If, you know, certain burrs, if they wear out, I throw them away. I may or may not buy any more, but those five or 10 that I use the most, you know, I, I'll go into a little bit of panic if I don't have, have them on hand and have them at all times. And, and you don't have to go to a lot of expense to get organized. I have a commercial burr box, but a lot of people have come to my classes and they've bought a, a dollar box that is meant for kids to put pencils and things in, put a piece of styrofoam in it and shove the burrs into it so they're standing up so they can see what they have. Yep. So what about you, Bonnie? What's, what's next on the agenda for you? Where are you going from here? Well, until things get straightened out, I, it's kind of moving on at the same plateau as far as gourds go, but I have so many other interests that I've enjoyed exploring other mediums while I've been away from teaching. I've done a lot more wood carving this year. Um, I'd like to try some mosaics and some other projects that I've been putting off. Um, I think a lot of people during this pandemic thought they were going to work nonstop on their gourds. And they found, you know, I need a break. I need to just do something else during this whole time. And, and so they're doing home renovations or cleaning out closets. And, and yep. that's a good thing, too, to clean out the closet. You discover all kinds of supplies you didn't know you had. Well, thanks a lot for uh, doing the interview and joining me. Oh, and you're welcome. I enjoyed it. I honestly, I, I think you've gave all kinds of great advice and uh, for a lot of people that's gonna take it and run with it. And I just wanna mention before we sign off here that if people wanna see more of your stuff, they can find you on Facebook, right? At Southwest Gourds, um, Instagram at Bonnie Gibson Art, and then your website, bonniegibsonart.com. And you also have the newsletter, right? Where people can sign up and-, and yes. And I've been they can I've, sign up from the bonniegibsonart.com site. There's a link there. Yep. And then also I'll say it again, don't forget about the American Gourd Society for $20 a year it is well worth the money. Well, thanks for hosting the interview, Roger. I really appreciate yeah. it. And Bonnie, I, I I really do appreciate it. And I think a lot of people is gonna enjoy this. So keep doing what you're doing, and I love seeing your work and I love following you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that was my first episode of Making Dust. And uh, uh, quite frankly, I think it's off with a great start. Uh, that was a great interview with Bonnie. And I know I personally learned quite a bit and uh, found it very interesting. Um, she had a lot of good advice to give. And I hope the rest of you also found this just as valuable as I did. So. Um, if you want to see more of this, make sure you subscribe if you haven't already to this channel, Wolf for Carving. And also, I'll put, add links uh, down in the comments of Bonnie's uh, website and her social media and stuff like that. So remember to subscribe, and I'll try to get more of these out to you guys. Till next time.